we have Finding Nemo, The Five Stages of Grief. A large community on Reddit was shocked to hear of one person's theory about the infamous Disney movie Finding Nemo. The user concluded that the movie was demonstrating the five stages of grief. The theory is that Nemo actually died with his siblings and mother, and that Marlin imagines a single egg surviving, demonstrating the first stage of denial, where he refused to accept that the horrific event happened. Then it becomes anger when Nemo does anything even remotely dangerous, then moves into bargaining, which Marlin does quite frequently on his quest to find Nemo. Then he eventually feels despair when he becomes ready to give up on the search, and then comes acceptance where he finally is at peace and learns to not obsess over Nemo. I wouldn't put it past Disney to have at least developed the idea from this starting point. This theory feels pretty accurate to me. If you're liking this video so far, don't forget to smash that like button as it will really help us out. In our ninth spot, we have Pinocchio. Not gonna lie, Pinocchio is a pretty messed up movie on its own. But my heart goes out to Geppetto. Now in the Disney movie, I don't think it said what happened to his wife. All we know is that he lives alone with his pets, carving wood. Poor guy was so lonely and all he wanted was a son to call his own. And when he finally does get a son, that little rat runs away from home and Geppetto risks his life to get him back. Geppetto deserved better. I mean, in the end, it worked out, but still, he deserved better. In our number eight spot, we have the frozen wisdom. I don't need to pray for this theory to be real or not because it's awesome and it just deserved an honorable mention. People are convinced that the writers of Frozen 2 may have perhaps gone to a lot of therapy in their time or worked with psychologists to help write the film because the film is filled with the most amount of wisdom. The type of wisdom you only hear from your therapist. Just do the next right thing, Anna sings as she makes the horrible realization that her sister Elsa and her friend Olaf have passed away. Anna sings about the grief that she is feeling and describes a heaviness that only people that have truly suffered from depression would understand. She goes on to coach herself to do the next right thing, take one step at a time. The best piece of advice you could give someone when they're in the thick of it all. In another case, the people of Arendelle have to evacuate and after the chaos, Olaf lets all of the young ones play with him and stick icicles in him. He says to them, we call this controlling what you can when things feel out of control. Another wonderful piece of advice. In our number seven spot, we have Peter Pan, the psychopath. Now we all know that Neverland is a place where you never have to grow up and you can be a kid forever. And that's all Peter wants for his friends, whether you're a lost boy or a darling. Sure, fun and games all day sounds amazing, but what if you get tired tired of childhood and decide it's time to grow up. Well, this theory suggests that Peter doesn't take too kindly to adults, even if they started off as friends. In fact, he hates adults so much that he wants to kill them. There are few adults in the movie, the main ones we see being Captain Hook and the crew of the Jolly Roger, and we know how much Peter hates them, so what if the Lost Boys decided it's time to become Lost Men? Well, following this theory, Peter kills any of the Lost boys who try to grow up and finds new ones to take their place so he has friends to play with forever. Captain Hook was actually one of the lost boys in the past and learned the truth of who or what Peter is and escapes, rescuing others as he does and they grow up into the crew. Ooh, This is why Hook hates Pan so much, so maybe Hook wasn't the villain after all. In our number six spot, we have a scorned lover. Ooh, this is a juicy fan theory that honestly feels like whomever came up with it must have also known the pain of being betrayed. The theory is around the movie The Beauty and the Beast. And the theory goes that the witch or enchantress that had created the curse that turned the prince into the beast and all of his royal courtiers into what are usually inanimate objects did so because she was a lover scorned. She and the beast were former lovers and and he dismissed her once he got bored of her, which is something that royals were known to do in the past. The courtiers also would have treated her badly because they are loyal to the prince, so she placed a curse on them to teach them a lesson about respecting women. Huh, I see it. It makes more sense than a witch trapping the whole house just because the prince was prideful. There was clearly a deeper lesson afoot. In our number five spot, we have Eeyore's origin. 
Ah, Eeyore, everyone's favorite depressed donkey. While everyone in the 100 acre wood is usually pretty carefree and happy, Eeyore seems to always be in a bad mood, and I would be too if my tail kept getting lost or stolen and my house collapsed all the time. But some theorists think that there is a more sinister reason for the gloomy nature. But for that, we need to go all the way back to the 1940s movie Pinocchio. In the film, our puppet protagonist becomes a real boy, and after some wild Wild adventuring, he is rewarded with a trip to Pleasure Island, a land where you can do anything you want and no grown ups can stop you. But there is a cursed place on the island, and anyone who indulges is turned into a donkey. And we see in the movie that many of the donkeys can still talk. So the theory suggests that Eeyore was once a real boy, and he made the mistake of going to Pleasure Island and was cursed to take his more furry form. But it seems he managed to escape to the safety of the 100 acre wood, and now he lives lives out the rest of his days longing to regain his lost humanity. In our number 4 spot we have Moana died. This is yet another very interesting and thought out theory around the movie Moana. In the beginning of the movie, Moana is on her boat stuck in a thunderstorm when the boat was struck by lightning. It is theorized that she died on the boat which is most likely what would happen to any living being. The theory is expanded to state that Moana's spirit is completing the quest for the rest of the journey and that is why she only meets gods and spirits the rest of the way. She is on their plane of existence. Hmm. Then the theorist went on to state that after she finishes her quest, her spirit goes back into her body and that is when she goes back to her island. Ooh, I bet you that some of these reddit theorists are really just Disney employees just you know, revealing secrets that they could only reveal anonymously. In our number 3 spot we have the fly. In the movie The Emperor's New Groove, Isma has all sorts of potions to turn people into any animal you can think of, and she turns Cusco into a llama. But I'm sure this isn't the only time she's done something like this. While most of the animals in the movie can't be understood by humans, like the squirrel only being able to communicate to Kronk through squeaks and gestures, there are obviously animals that can talk. Cusco as the llama, Isma as a cat, and there is one other strange example that throws the whole world of the film for a loop. The fly stuck in the spider's web. While walking in the forest, Kuzgo sees a fly trapped in a web and it is yelling out for help but it's devoured quickly. Now while this is an obvious reference to the 1958's The Fly, it also begs the question of who else has Isma turned into animals? Was this one of Cusco's once loyal subjects? And are there other jungle creatures who used to be humans out there? Let's hope they at least got to be better ones than a fly. In our number 2 spot we have the evil trolls. Ok, here's another frozen theory for you. What if Prince Hans wasn't actually evil. What if he was manipulated by magic? A lot of fans online thought that Prince Hans, who had a plot twist of being the overarching villain of the story, was a little out of left field. He was seemingly so good for most of the story and then all of a sudden he was evil. <laughs> well, one reddit user had a very good theory on this. The trolls, who are a part of Kristoff's family, have some very rare magic and as they have Kristoff's best interests at heart, perhaps they used magic to change Anna and Hans' path and to turned Hans evil so that Kristoff could end up with Anna. Hmm, arguably it's probably for the best as she actually had a friendship with Kristoff and all she knew about Prince Hans was that they had a few things in common like chocolate and sandwiches. <laughs> Not a solid basis for a lasting relationship. But still, perhaps the trolls altered Anna and Prince Hans's path and they are the true villains of the story. And finally we reach our number one spot, Walt's mom. Walt Disney of course. Ever wonder why none of the princesses or main characters in Disney movies seem to have mothers, or at least ones who are still alive? I mean Cinderella, Bambi, Ariel, Belle, Jasmine, the list goes on and on. Well, some think that this is actually related to a terrible tragedy in the Disney family. In 1937, Walt and his brother Roy bought their parents a house with their newfound success, a dream for anyone. But unfortunately, this would be a terrible mistake. One day, their mother Flora called Walt to complain that their furnace was leaking gas. Walt sent some folks from the studio over to fix it and they did, or so they thought. The next morning the housekeeper returned to find Mr. and Mrs. Disney unconscious and dragged them out into the front lawn. Their father was taken to a hospital and survived, but unfortunately their mother passed away at the scene. This tragedy was well known by those who worked at the studio and many thought that it affected the stories they told going forward. That Walt was so traumatized that he passed the trauma onto the characters in the films as a way to move on himself. Either 
way, it's interesting to look into the man who created an empire. Number 10, and we're going to be talking about Scar from The Lion King. Now, you don't really get lions that come meaner than Scar. Sure, he had a rough childhood, always growing up in the shadow of Mufasa, but nobody will ever be able to forgive him for killing his brother in such an evil way. Long live the king. Not only is he responsible for possibly the saddest moment in Disney history, he also tried to kill Mufasa's son, Simba, a total of five times. Like, what is your problem, mate? Oh, and he also ran the beautiful Pride Land into the ground, ruining it for an entire generation of animals. In our number nine spot, we have the Little Mermaid Hunter. In the original Little Mermaid, we learn that Ariel has a mother, but we never learn what happened to her until the 2008 movie The Little Mermaid Ariel's Beginning. That is when we find out that Ariel's mother, Athena, was killed by a pirate ship, which is why King Triton hates humans. Well, perhaps you may have heard of another Disney tale with pirates called Peter Pan. And in this tale, Captain Hook, the villain of the story, is the captain of a pirate ship. We also see a group of mermaids in Peter Pan at Mermaid's Lagoon, and one of them looks an awful lot like Ariel, and she is even wearing a gold crown! Probably the queen. So that of course has led to the theory that it was Captain Hook's ship that killed Ariel's mother, and therefore Captain Hook killed her. <gasps> that one blew my mind. At number 8 now, it's Ursula from The Little Mermaid. The name Ursula means she-bear, and she seems to suit that name with her demeanor quite well. She is possibly one of the most manipulative characters in all of the Disney movies, using a mixture of dark magic, trickery, and hypnosis to get what she wants and seize power. Ariel accidentally kills her pet eels that she has a pretty creepy relationship with, and so she does what any reasonable psychopath would do, and decides she's going to kill Ariel and then take the crown of the seven and seize from Ariel's father, King Triton. But luckily, she stopped at the last minute by plucky Prince Eric. Personally guys, if I was a Disney villain, I'd watch all the other Disney movies first and learn from those Disney villains mistakes. See? I'm not just a pretty face. But next up guys, we've got someone who's a bit of a devil. No, really, he's he's literally the devil. And number seven is Chernobog from the Fantasia movie. This villain from Disney's 1914 movie Fantasia takes evil to a whole new level. He appears to be the devil incarnate, and because of this, he doesn't commit evil acts for power or fame like other villains. He does it just for fun, and that's probably the most twisted part of it. In the movie, we see him summon the restless dead and demons and forces them to dance for him. Chernobog then plucks them at random to throw into the hellfire, grinning all the while. He is widely regarded as the most powerful Disney villain to date, which is pretty scary when you realise he was also created to represent pure evil. I remember being really small and watching Fantasia through my fingers like that, and if Chernobog scaring a little innocent three-year-old kid isn't the most evil thing in the world, I don't know what is. But barking her way into number six now, we've got a villain that makes me ashamed to be English. It's Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians. Now you might think you know people that are selfish, erratic, self-centered, and mentally unstable, but they're probably a delight to be with compared to Cruella de Vil. We've got a lot of villains on this list, but it takes a special kind of woman to do what this one does. Cruella de Vil tried to kill little puppies so that she could wear them as a coat. If that's not a clue to how horrible she is, then how about her name? It's literally a play on the words cruel and devil. Her wiki page even says that Cruella likes furs, smoking, money, spots, fashion, attention, and getting her own way. Now luckily, she didn't get her way when it came to turning those cute puppies into coats, but if she did, she'd probably be a lot higher up on the list. Moving on to number five now, we've got the Evil Queen from Snow White. When your official title is the Evil Queen, you're probably not going to be the nicest queen around. She asked the mirror on the wall who was the fairest of them all, and when she found out it was actually Snow White, she turned herself into an old woman, poisoned an apple, and then gave it to Snow White to kill her. And she succeeded. Well, kind of. Thankfully, the sleeping death spell was reversed by True Love's Kiss. But still, this was one cold-blooded murder attempt of an innocent woman that came down to superficial jealousy. She tried to become the most beautiful in the land, but I don't think it matters how pretty you are if you're still trying to kill young girls with poison fruit. 
kind of a turn off for everyone. All right guys, coming in at number four now, we've got Hades from Hercules. Now let's get past the fact that he's one of the coolest villains in Disney. I mean, come on, look at that hair for a start. Because the truth is, Hades is not the nicest guy around. He hates his job as overlord of the underworld and decides he wants Zeus's job as king of the gods instead. He tries and fails to kill his brother Zeus and nephew Hercules, but not before putting them through a whole lot of suffering, including the death of Meg, the woman that Hercules loves. So there's a reminder guys that if you ever find yourself in a job you don't like, you probably shouldn't try and kill your brother, your nephew, and then actually kill his girlfriend. It's pretty evil. And we're going to be staying pretty evil now guys as we move on to our number three and we're going to be talking about Sleeping Beauty's Maleficent. Maleficent is described as the incarnation of pure evil. She took offence at not being invited to Princess Aurora's christening and so decided to put the sleeping in Sleeping Beauty by cursing the princess to die before her 16th birthday by pricking her finger on a spinning wheel. Personally, I think that's exactly the kind of thing that stops you getting invited to these kind of events. People don't want to hang out with baby curses. Luckily, the curse gets modified to only put the princess into a deep sleep and not kill her, she possesses great powers of dark magic which she uses to curse people, turn herself into a dragon, and generally cause chaos, sorrow, and despair for anyone she chooses, especially innocent babies. Nasty, nasty cartoon woman. But now guys, let's move swiftly on to our number two. We're going over to China now to talk about Chan Yu from Mulan. Chan Yu is a bloodthirsty warrior who will stop at nothing to achieve his goal of conquering China. For him, murdering innocent people in cold blood isn't just part of his plan, it's one of the most satisfying things about it. When he captures two scouts, he sends them to deliver a message to the emperor, but not before mentally torturing them by joking about how he only needs one to do the job. It's implied in the movie that Shan Yu was responsible for the mass murder of an entire village, including children like the girl who owned the toy doll that we see. He's just an all round nasty bloke. Guys, it's one thing being a soldier in a war, it's another thing being a soldier in a war who makes sick jokes about the innocent children they've killed. Hmm. Now guys, coming in at number one, we've got Judge Frollo from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Now this character could probably contend with some of the most evil villains ever created, not just Disney ones. Judge Frollo's crimes are hard to list, but genocide is a pretty good place to start. It's thought that he killed countless Romani gypsies because he thought they went against his own religious beliefs and that they followed witchcraft and sorcery. He killed Quasimodo's mother and then forced him to live in the cathedral by convincing them that he was an abomination, and he claimed to be a holy man, yet he set Paris ablaze because of his aggressive sexual lust for Esmeralda, a woman who had already said no. This is despite her being part of the very same race of people he was determined to exterminate, so he's a hypocrite. But in the end, he's about to try and kill Quasimodo and Esmeralda with that sword, and he's all like... <laughs> Then he gets exactly what he deserves and it's also sweet justice and this happens. Yeah, take that Lord Frodo, that is what you get for just being a massive bad guy. Coming in at number 10 we have the evil stepsisters. Disney's movie Cinderella was based off of a book by the brothers Grimm, which was certainly super grim. So in the original book, when the prince arrives at Cinderella's house with the glass slipper, the sisters know their feet won't fit in it. So what do they do? Well, one sister cuts off her toe, and the other cuts off her heel to try to make the slipper fit and trick the prince. Oh yeah, okay, joke's on him for sure. But obviously, that didn't work out for them. Then in the ending scene during Cinderella's wedding, a bunch of birds peck out the sister's eyes. Definitely not Disney friendly. But before I get into number nine, make sure you hit that like button. It really helps us out, so please do it. Please, thank you very much. And now we will continue. Now though at number 9, we've got Aladdin Badi Jafar. Don't worry guys, not everyone on this list rhymes with Scar and Jafar. Now in this Disney classic, Aladdin wanted to get his hands on the magical genie lamp in the hopes of becoming a prince and marrying Princess Jasmine. Jafar, on the other hand, wanted to gain universal magical powers, enslave Princess Jasmine, kill Aladdin and take over the whole universe. Luckily, when his greedy wish to become an almighty genie himself backfires spectacularly, he gets sucked into a genie lamp as a result. But 
unfortunately, he comes back in the return of Jafar to do even more evil genie stuff. So yeah, he totally deserves to be on this list. Coming in at number eight, we have Wreck-It Ralph. Wreck-It Ralph was a pretty good movie. It taught children about stereotypes and how you should never judge a book by its cover. But one character sadly had a very tragic backstory, and that's Sergeant Calhoun. In the film, Fix-It Felix asks if Calhoun is always so intense. Another character replies saying it's not her fault. She was programmed with the most tragic backstory ever. And tragic it is. Basically, on Calhoun's wedding day, a cybug burst into the church and ate her husband. Calhoun defends herself and her wedding guests by shooting the cybug. But then we eventually learned that cybugs turn into whatever they eat. Meaning, it would have turned into her husband. Meaning, Calhoun shot and killed her own husband. That's why she acts so tough all the time. On the inside, she's depressed from the loss of her husband. In our seventh spot, we have Peter Pan. Peter Pan was based off a book by J.M. Barry, but Peter Pan has a darker past than we realized. Peter was actually based off of J.M. Barry's older brother, David. Sadly, David passed away due to an ice skating accident. It's said that he created Peter to keep the image of his brother alive. He created Neverland as a place for his brother to go to, meaning that Neverland is a place for dead children. It's like a heaven. Then this makes the whole movie twisted. Why would Peter want to bring Wendy and her brothers to Neverland if they were still alive? Like, was he trying to kill them? Probably. Coming in at number six, we have Sleeping Beauty. So we all know that in the end of Sleeping Beauty, Aurora is woken up by a kiss on the lips from the prince. They then live happily ever after together. That's not exactly what happens in the 17th century version of Sleeping Beauty. So instead of the prince kissing her on the lips, he uh, gets her pregnant. Keep in mind, Aurora was in a coma when this happened, so she did not consent and had no clue what he was doing. Nine months later, she gives birth to twin babies, which wakes her up from the curse. Then it gets even more twisted, and the prince's wife, yeah, he was married, gets jealous and tries to cook Aurora and her kids. But instead, the jealous wife gets thrown into a cauldron and cooks to death. Bon appetit. And then they lived happily ever after. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Finding Nemo. This movie is more messed up than you think. Right off the bat, Marlin sees the love of his life get killed. Then the rest of his family gets killed. All but one, who's born with a disability because of the attack. Now Marlin lives his life in constant fear. He's scared he's going to lose someone else that's close to him. He's been through a lot, he probably suffers from PTSD. And then one day, his worst nightmare comes true when his son gets taken from him. Poor Marlin, he's been through so much. Coming in at number four, we have Meet the Robinsons. Lewis Robinson just deserves one big hug. Like, he went through so much as a kid. So, for starters, when Lewis was just a baby, he was abandoned by his mother. She literally just dropped him off at an orphanage and then made a run for it. So, he was raised in this orphanage and he struggled to fit in. He even struggled to get adopted. He scared off over 124 possible parents. Imagine how that probably made him feel. He probably felt like he wasn't worthy of love. All because he was a little different. No one loved him for his uniqueness. It, it just scared people away. See, I just want to give him one big hug. <laughs> In our third spot, we have Cinderella. Yeah, we're talking about Cinderella again. I don't think everyone realizes just how dark her backstory is. So for starters, Cinderella's mom dies when Cinderella was very young. Her dad then becomes super depressed and marries a terrible woman. He welcomed her and her family into his family, and when he died, they all turned evil. So Cinderella lost her dad, and in a way, she lost not just one mom, but two. And then she gets locked away from everyone else and all she does is clean all the time. She gets treated as a maid. Cinderella had it rough. Even if she did have a happily ever after, her past is still going to haunt her. Moving on to number two, we have Lilo and Stitch, another great classic Disney movie. But sadly, Lilo and Nani had a really sad backstory. In the film, it's implied that their parents died in a car accident during bad weather conditions. This is messed up for a number of reasons. Number one, 
Nani is only 18 years old and is left to care for herself and her sister. She's got no support from other family members, meaning she was forced to grow up fast to raise her sister. Her life is now spent caring for her younger sister and being a parent to her at such a young age. Then on top of caring for Lilo, she has to work in order to financially support herself and her sister. Imagine that happening to you at 18 years old. On top of that, she's worried about being deemed an unfit caregiver and having her sister ripped out from under her. Poor Nani, she had it rough and she sacrificed so much for Lilo. And in our number one spot, we have Bambi. So yes, Bambi opens with a pretty sad scene with Bambi's mom getting shot. But did you know that Disney actually planned to show Bambi's mom getting shot on screen? Yeah, that was gonna be a thing. It probably would've screwed up a lot of kids. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about. No, it gets worse. So Bambi was based off of a novel written by Felix Salton titled Bambi, A Life in the Woods. Well, that book is anything but kid friendly. In the book, Bambi ends up getting shot by a hunter. Then he is taught to walk in a circle to spread his blood around to confuse the hunters and dogs that are tracking him. Then in another scene, Bambi's father takes Bambi to go look at a dead body of a man who's been shot. That's so messed up. I'm never looking at Bambi the same way ever again. 